Well, look, our next interview isn't so much about a specific event or a specific set of data. Simply a response to conversations I've been having with a lot of my friends and contacts around the country about where we are at. Things were pretty tough during COVID and coming out of COVID, economically and simply in trying to get back to some sort of normal. And then came the rain and then came the cyclone. And many people I've spoken to feel disheartened, economically disheartened. Our property, residential property market, for various reasons, is, well, in Wellington, pretty well in free fall. Uh, we have a huge labour shortage. And now I understand by talking to my sources that supply chain issues are likely to ramp up again, particularly in April, and that we are going to be sh short of affordable produce in some supermarket um, categories, for example, because of the impacts of Cyclone Gabriel. It is clear in many of our city, cities and in terms of our national uh, transport infrastructure, we have been underspending and we need to spend more. And we have a government that told us last year we're going to go into a recession. So what is the prospect for the economy? What is coming? And do the figures, does the data back up this I've got to say, general feeling of malaise that I get from many New Zealanders I know. Well, to pick this apart, we're joined by the Chief Economist for Infometrics, uh, Brad Olson, on the line now. Brad, uh, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. Good morning. It's good to be here. Uh, Brad, firstly, on a personal note, do you get what I'm saying? A lot of people feeling a bit glum in all sorts of ways? Absolutely. And I think for a lot of people as well, there's a feeling of uh, what is to come next. You know, not only a feeling of glumness right here and now, but, you know, how long uh, might that glumness continue? When we look through the data, we, we do start to see signs of this as well. Uh, business confidence remains at or near record lows, depending on the measure you're looking at. Uh, consumer confidence, also extremely low. Uh, people's expectations for what their own personal uh, financial situation is at the moment and will be in the future isn't fantastic. Uh, but I do think as well that part of this is because of just how incredible the last few years have been for the economy. I mean, you noted in the intro uh, the likes of Wellington house prices now down 20% uh, or so, you know, the largest fall we've seen in recent times. At the same time, two years back or so, they were up 40%. So I think we've been on sort of a roller coaster ride and that has made us feel quite ill. Uh, we're now coming down to the bottom of that roller coaster ride and we're wondering uh, when the next sharp turn is, is coming forward. So I do think there's a lot of disruption. Uh, certainly in the economy, we now have the most well signalled recession in New Zealand's economic history. Uh, we haven't seen the inflation levels we've got at the moment uh, in, in a generation. None of this is particularly easy to go through. So I, I can understand the glumness. I guess the one other point, though, that does need to be mentioned is that uh, I think we've got uh, a lot of economic activity behind us. There's enough momentum that we're currently running through. Uh, at least it's something to go into tough, a tougher period of economic uh, challenge with. I'd rather, if you will, have to slow down from 100 kilometres an hour down to 50 than it already be at 50 and slow down to zero. So you're saying, despite that mood, which is undeniable and which you've admitted you've felt, uh, you've felt, the data suggests this isn't, if you like, the end of the world. That's correct. And I think part of it as well is because it's, it's, I see when I talk to people, and we see this in the numbers as well, a bit of a disconnect between right here and now and what's coming uh, in the future. And I say that because I think that talking to a lot of people, they're nervous about the future, they're nervous about what happens when the interest rates uh, flip over because they know it's coming. Uh, but of course, that hasn't happened yet to all households. Uh, businesses are also looking out there and looking at lower sales and similar into the future, but not necessarily seeing them right here, right now. Uh, we know that when we look at electronic card transactions, there's still a heap of money going through the tools. Uh, of course, 
you're not necessarily getting as much much uh, bang for buck because your margins being squeezed with inflation and similar. Uh, but the current economic numbers are fairly upbeat. Uh, back in the September quarter, we saw a, a pretty well, in fact, an incredibly large 2.0% quarterly jump. That's a pretty big increase in economic activity. And increasingly, I think what we're going to see this year is the difference coming through by sector. Uh, if you're in the tourism sector, for example, you've gone from a really challenging position to something a lot better. You've got more people coming in, but at the same time, uh, you've got those labour shortages, you've got issues around uh, finding staff and around your margins. Uh, if you look at other sectors, uh, though, you know, the likes of retail trade, again, if your interest rates are going up, people are going to put food on the table, they're going to put fuel on the car, they're going to put a roof over their head. After that, a lot more spending becomes discretionary. So I sort of feel like we're in this cautious holding pattern period where we're not quite sure of just how the challenges in front of us will be, but we know that there is a bit of a cliff edge coming up. All right, but fundamentally, this economy is functional and will go through this cycle and come out the other end. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we still have the highest employment rate uh, in our, our uh, modern labour market history. We've got the highest participation rate as well. Uh, we know that there are incredible businesses up and down the country that are figuring out a way to do stuff uh, and have done over the last three years. I'm incredibly confident that we'll be able to maintain uh, that in general throughout, uh, but I think we've got to realise as well that after such a big sprint over the last few years, after such a huge amount of money was poured into the economy, uh, effectively this is a bit of a reset, cool-down period. Uh, like when you're on the spin cycle in the gym or something, it tells you to have a break for a little bit of time. That's almost what I feel like we're going through here to make sure that we've got a more sustainable picture. And that's important to communicate because despite all of the challenges in front of us, and I do not deny how difficult they will be, I think we've got to keep confidence that we have figured out how to manoeuvre through a pretty a topsy-turvy world in the last few years. Businesses have got on and done it. Uh, local, local households have figured out a way forward. It's going to be challenging, but I back us to make it through. Who will get us through? Is the government responsible for getting us through or is it those people who pull the levers inside the economy at the coalface? Oh, it's, it's, it's definitely both. Um, and I think for the government, and look, they've pretty well picked up on this this year, which is important, they've realised that they had bitten off more than they could chew in terms of delivery. Uh, that was causing us to effectively, uh, as a country, be able to deliver less than what we wanted but at a greater cost. Now, that's not a particularly good uh, equation there. So I think, you know, government does have to come to the party here with getting the right investments in the right places, making sure that it's getting value for money when it's spending taxpayer dollars. Uh, and at the same time, the households are going to have to figure out how they navigate uh, these sort of challenges on their own. Uh, there's no easy wins when it comes to high inflation, and that is still the chief economic concern. Uh, certainly for the government as well at the moment, uh, with the huge repair bill coming through from the cyclone, uh, you do get the feeling that the government doesn't have a lot of options to just add more and more work on top of its already full plate. Uh, if it's going to load the cyclone recovery work on, it's got to put something else off to the side uh, to do another day because we just simply don't have the people and the resources right here and now to do absolutely everything we want. We've got to prioritise. We've got to be a lot smarter with what we get on with uh, and not everything is achievable right this second. And I guess in some ways that's a macro picture of the micro for every household in this situation. You have to make the choice between the nice-to-haves and the must-haves and that's how you, how you run a family budget. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we're seeing households already that are making those sort of adjustments. When we look at spending data, for example, uh, we know that households are still spending a lot on uh, the supermarket, partly because of how much food prices have gone up, but partly because that is an essential cost. You're not going to, uh, you know, turn that one away. But we are starting to see people funding less renovations, less DIY, less electronics and, and uh, homeware and similar uh, fewer purchases of clothes and toys and, and what have you. Um, but again, we're still spending on fuel. We're still making sure that uh, you're paying the rent or, or the mortgage. Uh, those ones are becoming very expensive costs. You look at a uh, mortgage repayment at the moment, and if you're buying a home or a bought a home in the last year, you're spending half of your average household income to service that mortgage. Uh, that doesn't leave nearly as much for all these other things. So again, 
food on the table, fuel in the car, roof over your head, everything after that becomes a lot more difficult to put into this uh, household budget. And the message there as well for businesses and retailers uh, is that you, there's a, a, a challenge this year to make sure that if you want a, a slice of that smaller household uh, budget pie, you're going to have to make a very convincing argument, not only for why your product or service is a good product or service, but why it deserves money more than whatever else uh, the household has on its mind. So a big focus on marketing, and I think we've got to you know, highlight again here that uh, we're into a different environment. Uh, the last few years, sales have just boomed for just about everywhere uh, apart from tourism. You know, the amount of money going through the economy was incredible. Uh, now that we're in the slow period, we're going to have to work uh, a fair bit harder for those sales to come through. Brad, what about primary production and, and the hit that has taken? And, and it's really hard. You see the pictures of devastation in the East Valley and you think, oh, all of Hawke's Bay and the East Cape is wiped out. That's, that's not the case. Does Gabriel, though, in the medium, short to medium term, uh, produce a supply problem for that part of the economy? Uh, yes, I think it does produce a supply problem. I was up in Hawke's Bay myself on Friday to uh, see things firsthand, and I think there's two important messages here. Uh, where there are, where there has been, you know, just absolute devastation and disruption, uh, it will take time for that activity to come back. There will be, and has already been, uh, reduced output of, you know, stone fruit, uh, of, of apples, of kumara from, from up in, in Kuiper as well in the north. Um, that is all going to make it more challenging uh, because you've got the same level of demand, same number of people across the country that want to eat this food, uh, but less of that food that's become available. Supply has, has been reduced, so you will see price uh, increases. You'll also likely see it in the construction sector as the rebuild gets going and in the rental market because, again, you've got more people needing houses and more houses that aren't available uh, anymore. But uh, the broader important message, I think, to highlight is that, yes, there's disruption, but actually there's a heck of a lot of the Hawke's Bay that is fully operational. Uh, and, and I think that's the challenge at the moment is that a lot of what we're seeing and hearing, quite rightly, is around the devastation that's gone on. Uh, but one of the messages I received very clearly from businesses on the ground in the Hawke's Bay is that a lot of them are open for business. They're excited to see people coming through. They're looking forward to seeing the healthy cash flow that visitors will continue tribute. So I think we've got to be careful that we don't uh, completely sort of run ourselves into the ground here. Yeah, Brad, good point, Brad. Look, Brad, someone else has written, and uh, Nigel's written, he said, uh, could you ask your speaker about the collapse of SVB, that Silicon Valley Bank in the US, and its effects in New Zealand? Could this happen in New Zealand? What protection do we have? Uh, the collapse of a, of a bank that big is noteworthy. Uh, I think Rocket Lab had some money with them, though they say it doesn't affect their operations. Is that indicative of a global malaise or is that a one-off? I think it's a one-off and I certainly hope it's a one-off. Uh, when we look through the numbers and I had looked through some of the financials last night, uh, what it looks like is that effectively SVB uh, took out a whole bunch of uh, a certain type of, of asset uh, and they didn't hedge any of their bets. Uh, the likes of every other bank, not, not only in the US but particularly here in New Zealand, has a much wider spread uh, of various investments so that it can cover itself uh, when people might call on their, their money. Uh, what you saw in SVB is that they had basically, uh, although they had a bunch of assets, when they looked at the value of those assets, they were effectively zero. And so when they looked to try and move those numbers around, they came up with a $1.8 billion loss. And by the time they'd been able to try and get some financing in place to fix all of that big hold up, uh, the market had, had tanked. People were running to the bank and saying, I'd like my money before you collapse, please, which precipitated the collapse. Uh, but if you look here in New Zealand, that isn't happening. We've got a much, much stronger uh, focus on uh, the holdings that banks have to have. And we know as well that the banks were stress tested, I think it was last year, by the Reserve Bank. Uh, and they all passed a, being able to cope with quite a few uh, challenges being thrown yeah, Mind you, a lot of people now griping that the banks make too much money. And I always think it's much, I'd rather have my money in a bank or have loan money from a bank that make it, that's making plenty of money that one that doesn't know how to. Well, exactly. I mean, if your bank's not making money, it's probably not the place that you want to 
uh, sort of be seeing it, but particularly with return from you wondering where it's coming from. So, look, I'm confident. I think SVP as well, obviously a lot more exposed, uh, almost purely exposed to the tech and startup sector. Uh, that's quite different from what you're looking at for, a, you know, just me taking my money down to my bank and having it in the deposit account. Um, so I'm certainly not stressed, but it does highlight that uh, for small and medium banks, there's always a few more challenges. You don't have the same size of the balance sheet. Uh, you don't have access to the same sorts of investments and similar. Uh, so we've always got to keep our wits about us. We should be cautious about it. Uh, but this certainly doesn't mean that uh, there's any risks to New Zealand banks at present. All right. Uh, look, Brad, the other thing, it is election year, and I think we can now say it is going to be October because Hipkins is going up, uh, not down, and they'll hold on for as long as they can. Elections do can produce economic uncertainty. Do you see a major difference as it stands between the likelihood of either of the major parties getting elected? Uh, and do you need to factor in election uncertainty uh, into economic forecasting in an election year? Yeah, partially is probably the, the answer. We um, we often think when we come up to elections that there is a bit of a lull period uh, before they happen. Uh, businesses often sort of can sometimes wait on some big decisions if they feel like a change in government or a continuation of government uh, could could sort of see their business operations change around a bit. Um, I don't see there be as much scope of that this year. There's not uh, huge, huge reforms that seem to be on the cards that would make a uh, tangible difference day one to a business, uh, sort of longer term, much more structural changes. Uh, the one area that does probably have a bit more uh, caution as we come through this year is around the property market. Uh, there is uh, you know, very different options on the table depending on uh, which government is elected in October. Uh, you know, will there be interest in actability on rentals and, and similar? Um, that could well sway the market a bit. But again, if I'm a property investor uh, at the moment, I'm a lot more worried about interest rates going up and, and how much capital I have access to uh, than, you know, in uh, what is still a fair way off another six months' time or so, seven months' time uh, before an election happens. So there's possibly a bit of a, a slowdown or a lull period, uh, but I think given all the other things happening in the economy, I don't think it would be particularly noticeable in the numbers that you could pin it down and say, ah, yeah, there's the election effect coming through. Yeah. Brad, that was fantastic. Thank you. You answered every question I asked, and they were just straight from, I think, uh, Middle New Zealand. Um, a terrific wrap-up. And I guess if my takeaway is, yeah, it's going to be tough, but we hang in there, and the sky isn't falling. It's just a bit cloudy. Absolutely. And look, it was so, so flippin' hot recently, if you will, that we were burning our feet on the sand. Uh, now that there's sort of a cooler period coming through, it'd be nice to sort of just sit on the beach uh, without uh, the wind and the rain, but also without the sun burning us to a crisp. Uh, we're trying to find that Goldilocks zone, and there's got to be a few ups and downs before we uh, hit the temperature right. Brad, thank you so much for your time, mate. Always good talking to you. That is Brad Olsen. He is the uh, Chief Economist for Infometrics. Oh, I feel a little bit better now. I don't feel quite so down about life, the economy in general. Look, a message to the anonymous person who sent me this text. There are many people withdrawing huge amounts of cash in New Zealand this week. How do you know that? How can you say that? How can you send me a text and expect me to take you seriously? Where do you get your data on that? Or are you just having a little bit of a moment this morning? My advice to you, dear anonymous... Have a cup of tea and a lie down or ring me up and tell me where you get that information on. Um, wow, thanks, Sean, for asking that question. Good interview. I'm now becoming a Plus member today. Thank you very, very much indeed for doing that. Um, Robin, Robin, you wanted to know how much it costs to be a Platform Plus member a week? Look, just sit down. This is going to be a bit of a shocker, mate. It's three whole dollars. Three whole dollars to get Platform Plus, and that's more access to what we do when we're going to build the accessibility on Platform Plus. And really, um, the more of you do that, the fewer ads i got to run. Um, Sean, I was walking through my local countdown. I found a significant reduction of produce and products on the shelf. Yeah, I've noticed that. I eat a lot, believe it or not, a lot of canned fruit, like pears, peaches and stuff. Um, really, really like um, pears, which I love. Put the can in the fridge, eat them cold, just lovely on their own. Um, really hard to find. Uh, even a fellow shopper commented to me they are worried about food supply. I had to agree. 
This government and the Reserve Bank are driving the inflation and are making things worse. Well, I don't know, Brett. I, I just think we've had a whole lot of circumstances. I don't think anyone died of starvation in New Zealand, unless it was deliberate, for quite a long time. So I wouldn't worry that you are actually going to starve. But some of the nice stuff we've had might not be there. Um, where has this guy been living not talking to our business people? He's a really highly qualified economist. Sure, well, I'm in the process of more in, withdrawing more than 10k bash from the bank. They put a lot of rigmarole in place. Why are you taking your money out of the bank? Are you doomsday prepping or something? 